Truth Unveiled here, and today I have some interesting stuff to share with you. We're going to be talking about the true locations and continuing with our series on this, covering the true locations of ancient places in scripture. And today we're mostly going to be focusing on ancient Assyria, along with the recap of some of the other places that we've already discussed and gone over in great detail. Now, if you already have not seen the documentary, I highly recommend you do along with the narrated version so you can get a better understanding and a better idea of locations that we've already covered and gone over, locations including the true scriptural Yasharal in Jerusalem, along with places such as Zion, Babylon, and the list goes on. And like I said, you can refer to the video and to all of the links and sources that are linked in the video in the description box along with a ton of resources also because we also covered the scriptural Ophir too. But today we will be covering more of ancient Assyria and I'm going to be sharing with you where that truly is because if you really think that it's where they tell us it's time to think again. Now I'm going to give this disclaimer and this is probably going to be the only time I do this and the only video I do this. For those who are trying to say and debunk everything that has been presented on this network when it comes to these true locations and when it comes to the research time and the effort put into this, here is what I'm going to say about this. The first thing I'm going to say is that this is not something that has started just yesterday. This is not one of those types of videos that I just randomly decided to put together yesterday or decided to randomly put together last week or even last month or even last year. This is years worth of research. This is years worth of being led by the Rook, by the spirit of Yahuwah. This is years worth of countless time and countless hours that's put into this. Why am I bringing this up? Because this is something that is new to all of us. This is something that unless you've been doing years and years worth of research on, it's not best to speak about something unless you fully know it and unless you've fully been really doing your research and fully being led, not based on the lies that they've been telling us, but based on hard evidence and hard facts. Now, certain videos that have been put out trying to debunk these claims, well, one of the main ones was the borders of so-called the Asheral, placing the borders between the Nile, between the river of Egypt, along with the Euphrates, the Euphrates in so-called Iraq, and then saying and making erroneous statements that, oh, ancient maps that go all the way back from the 1600s, oh, we cannot trust those maps because they were drawn by our enemies and things like that, and statements like that. Well, let me tell you this. How do you know this map right here? The map that they show you and the map that they give you, this map was drawn by our enemies and crafted by the enemies and the historians and the cartographers following their false narrative. That's why they moved it to these false regions and placed it in these false regions in the first place and then drew false maps. So to make a statement like that is just hypocritical. Because you can say the same thing about the 1948 borders of Israel too. And then there's the argument about Egypt when it comes to Egypt and the borders thereof, when it comes to Mariam and Yahusha, the Messiah, fleeing from Yasharal, going down to Egypt. And then some are saying, oh, but there's a big distance in between the two of them from so-called South Africa to Egypt. So there could possibly be no way that the land is in so-called South Africa when it comes to Egypt. But let me ask you this question. How do you know that today's borders of Egypt were the real borders of scriptural Egypt? How do you know that? How does any of us know that? By the way, in our video, we've even presented facts showing you and sharing with you Egyptian hieroglyphics and Egyptian artifacts that were found where? Even as south as Zimbabwe. So rather than approaching this topic with our own understanding and what's been presented for us for thousands and thousands of years, how about we approach this with the renewed mind instead? And what about what we've been conventionally taught about Rome and everything like that? And how could Rome potentially conquer all of Southern Africa, so-called? Well, we have to remember that things looked different back then. Once upon a time, in ancient maps, as you see right here in this one from 1596, 
Well over 400 years ago, we see Herod right here in the African region. And just like what we've gone over when the British conquered so-called South Africa, how do you know the same thing wasn't the case for Roman occupation during the time of the Messiah? What? Nothing new is under the sun. And to say that ancient maps are not reliable because they're drawn by our enemies, well, that's not what his word says. Because last I checked, his word says to do what? Ask for the ancient path and see that it is good and to walk in the ancient path. His word even talks about time and time again that the word is like hidden treasure. Yahusha, our Messiah, even says that the reign of Shammim is like hidden treasure. So what does that mean? That means we are to seek the ancient ways. We are to seek and find ancient maps, search search through ancient maps, search through the ancient things, because that's where we'll find the truth. Like he says, when you seek me with your whole heart, then you will find him. It's just like a treasure hunt. And with any type of treasure hunt, what do you need in a treasure hunt in order to find the treasure? You need a map in order to find it. Because see, our Messiah, he knew exactly what would happen. He knew what, what would take place. He knew everything before it even happened. That's why he spoke in parables. He already knew that maps would be burned. He already knew that the original maps of original locations would be hidden. He already knew this stuff. And he knew that our enemies would go down to Africa to the real true scriptural places and locations just like we're about to show you with the Syria today in this video he already knew that they would go there and that they would chart it on their maps and hide it from the rest of the world during the time that they went to go search for it during pre-colonial times in the 1500s and the 1600s he already knew that just like he knew that knowledge would be increased According to the prophecies of Donna Yal or Daniel chapter 12, and because of that, he knew that we would soon enough have access to these maps that have been hidden for a long time. That's why these maps of ancient Africa are so expensive. Why do you think they're so expensive where they're close to a quarter of a million dollars, an eighth of a million dollars? Why do you think that is? Because your elite have gone through great lengths to hide this stuff and to promote their atheism agenda. And that even includes with the true locations by forging their own locations, bringing certain artifacts to their fake ones, and then promoting their narrative. And again, I know there's going to be attacks on this subject. I already know it, and I knew it even before making these videos. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want people knowing the truth. The enemy doesn't want folk knowing this stuff. That's why they've gone through great lengths to hide it, and is even using YouTube as a source to continue the lies and the deceptions. Not anymore. Because books and maps will also tell you the same thing, the same sources as we've gone over with countless amounts of scripture, just like we've shown you and shared with you how Cana land is what? The land of Canaan. And it's not only on maps where you find this. They subliminally tell you this right here too in what? The Canaan local municipality right there. You see it, Canaan, the land of Canaan. Where? In so-called South Africa. You see Zor right there, which is a scriptural town too. And you see what? The seal right there that looks like what? In the ancient Yaudith language, this is an all or the letter Aleph. A 600-year-old map even shows you the location of the Garden of Eden in so-called South Africa right here from a map drawn in 1411 and where? So-called South Africa near where? The land of Canaan, the promised land. Books will even tell you the exact same thing because here is a book that comes from the Dictionary of Southern African Place Names and it's by R.E. Raper right here. And if you go up to Canaan right here, as I'm going to do right now, you'll see what? What does it say? Canaan, region extending right here north of mountains and it's what? The name is derived from one of the languages and refers to the Kana root. But what does it say here? It's also encountered as what? Canaan spelled with a K, which we just saw named for that municipality, along with one of the ancient map. And what? Canaan's land? The land of Canaan? But again, some people are still going to look at all of this and they're still going to try to debunk it and they're still going to try to deny it and they're still going to try to say whatever it is that they need to say and that's fine. 
But know this, the truth will make us free. And again, I understand too that it's been thousands of years worth of brainwashing. It's been thousands of years worth of lies. It's been thousands of years of inherited lies based on the Gentiles and their ancestors. So I understand that completely. And now is the time to break out of these lies. But I understand that it's a process. And I also understand that it's what? Anger, denial, and then acceptance afterwards. But I had to get that out there to let everyone know that. But moving forward, we also even covered scriptural Gibeon. And we told you how Gibeon was what? A so-called meteorite. And Yahuwah willing in future videos, because we're going to be starting a playlist on true locations. So Yahuwah willing, one of them that we will cover and that we're planning to cover more is so-called meteors. Because what are they really? Those are hailstones, as we've talked about. And it's it was named after the nearest town in Gibeon, which is in so-called Namibia, which is the real scriptural Gibeon. Here is the location of Gibeon right here in Namibia, as you can see in southern Namibia, as it's commonly known today. Now, again, we know that this is part of the lies. This is part of the deception when they tell us, oh, these are meteorites that were found how many millions of years ago? And oh, they're meteorites and they're so old. And oh, they come from outer space when there is no such thing as outer space. But really what it is is that these are large hailstones that the scripture speaks of as we've talked about with the book of Yahusha or Joshua chapter 10 specifically verses 10 through 12 that's what that's talking about of course your wicked translators are trying to hide all that and your wicked archaeologists and so-called scientists are trying to cover that up and play the game cover up which is their favorite game which is the game of lies but now it's time to expose them however after doing further research on Gibeon itself Itself, it's very interesting because one of the biggest specimens that is known to be found is 420 kilograms that still resides in the Hamburg collection today. Do you know how heavy that is? 420 kilograms? That is the equivalent of what? Over 900 pounds? Now those are some heavy rocks indeed. Now before we fully get into our topic and discussion of Assyria specifically, I also wanted to bring this up in that same region in so-called Namibia, southern Namibia, which is this, and I don't know if many of you have heard of it, but it's called Mukorab, which is the Nama word for the finger of all, or the finger of our creator, was what? A prominent landmark in southern Namibia near the village of Asab. The rock pinnacle consisted of an up upper top heavy sandstone pillar some 12 meters in height and weighing about 450 tons which rested on a thin neck of soft mudstone and it tells you more information about how it looks and things like that and you can read more about this I'll link it in the description box but this is how it looked now it's interesting because it fell or it debrided in about 1988 towards the end of 1988 so basically about 30 years ago now of course they tell you that oh it was 130 it's what millions of years old and it became isolated 50,000 years old again that's part of the lies and that's also what we're doing throughout this video is not only exposing the lies but again what we have to do with all of this is use discernment chew the meat and spit out the bones but this is how the structure looked back then if you look for the source on Wikipedia, this is what you'll get. And this is the picture that you see, the finger of all, before it's collapsed right there. And you'll see that it was a sandstone rock formation in the Namib Desert, which collapsed as of December 7th, 1988, nearly 30 years ago. Now, again, I find it very interesting and suspicious indeed how this is within the same region of Gibeon. It's in the same region of scriptural Beersheba, and it's in the same region region of scriptural Jerusalem and it just so happens to be deemed named this is that a coincidence but now we're going to be taking a look at more of Akkadia or more of ancient Assyria. Now pay very careful attention to this city right here, Akkad, because we're going to show you something with that. But we're going to take a look at Wikipedia and there's a reason for this because they're going to tell you that the Akkadian Empire was the first ancient empire of Mesopotamia. And we're going to be going over that word Mesopotamia and how that word is used for the translators as part of the deception. But anyway, 
Yahweh centered in the city of Akkad and its surrounding region, also called Akkad in ancient Mesopotamia in the scripture. So we see that it is a scriptural town. The empire united Akkadian and Sumerian speakers under one rule. The Akkadian empire exercised influence across Mesopotamia, the Levant, and Anatolia according to them. Now let me ask you this. According to the scriptural Akkadia, was scriptural Akkadia located in this region or was it located in Africa? Now this is what's very interesting or suspicious indeed and once again this is how they subliminally put the truth right in front of us and you're going to see what I'm talking about with this highlighted word right here because they have Akkad but then they have or Agade was the name of a Mesopotamian city and its surrounding area. Well, it just so happens, and I'm going to show you in a second, that you see this word in ancient maps in Africa somewhere. Now, before I take you to those ancient maps, I just wanted to cover this real quick because, again, there's a huge deception. And one of the deceptions perpetrated is this one right here when it comes to the word Mesopotamia. Because your English translations, they use the word Mesopotamia. However, the Yaudiath word right here is what? Aram Naarayim. Aram Naarayim, which means what? Aram of the two rivers, of the two rivers, a district of Aram. Now also the word Syria is part of the deception too, because scripturally speaking, the land was never known as Syria. Let me repeat that. The land was never known as Syria. It was known as Aram. It was originally called Aram, not Syria, just like it was called Aram Naarayim, not Mesopotamia. Why is that? That's so important because this is going to help us locate a cod which we just read earlier but as you see right here it says two rivers right there now, scripturally speaking, is it talking about these two rivers located in Iraq where it's the fake ones given to us by the cartographers and the wicked translators? Or is it talking about these two rivers right here? Is it talking and referring to the two rivers of the Nile? Because you have the white Nile right here, and then you have the blue Nile right there where they separate or where they meet together in Khartoum, which is the capital of present-day Sudan. Now going back to the videos that we've covered on the ancient maps and speaking of ancient Babylon specifically, how do we know that this could be one indicator that scripture is talking about this region over here and that these two rivers are our marker points? One way to know is, well, the maps show you and depict Babylon maps that are what? 300 plus years old in Sudan near Mero. Now that region is known for its pyramids and those ancient pyramids, folks, I think are attributed to ancient Babylon. Now here's Babylon shown near Ammon right here. And we've also covered how this is the scriptural Ammon located in present day Libya. This map comes from 1552 that shows you Babylon near its present day Egypt as it's known along the Nile River. Now here's another map that shows you right here Babylon and here you have the Nile right here and the other Nile going this way. So you see the two rivers and there's Babylon along with other scriptural regions nearby. But the question that we're going to be thinking about is where is Assyria in all of this? Because we've already shown you in a map from 1525, so a map that's nearly 500 years old, we've shown you a map of Babylon right here in media right there, which is what? Scriptural media. That's what that's talking about. There's Moro Sudan. Here we see once again the Nile River and Babylon right there. Knowing that is so important because that's how we're able to find and pinpoint our Acadia. That's how we're able to pinpoint scriptural Assyria also, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Now again, we have Brashith, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, that gives us a cod right here. We saw that in Strong's, and it says right here, in the beginning of his reign was Babal and Arak and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar or Shiner as it's commonly known today. From that land he went to Ashashur, Assyria, and he built Nayanuwa, what's commonly known as Nineveh, and Rehoboth Ir and Kalak. So it told us that Babal and Akkad are near the region of Shinar. Now where is present day Shinar? 
Well, if you go to the Greek in the Septuagint, you'll see that Shinar matches what? Sinar right here, spelled like this. Sinar right there, which is used for what? Mesopotamia. But again, we just showed you based on the language that it should not be called Mesopotamia, that it should be called the area of the two rivers. Well, is that area in the Nile? Now here's a map of Sinar right there. You see it's the same spelling that we just looked at in the Greek for Shinar. And where is it? It's in where? Along the Nile River, the same area as Babylon right there. You see it and this is a map from where? 1806, so it's over 200 years old. Other maps from the 1800s will show you in the same region. Here's the Nile River. Here is Sinar. And we just showed you that Babylon is in this area in so-called Sudan. And here's Sinar right there. And then the Tigri, which references and denotes what? The Tigris region around where? The Nile region, one of those rivers of scripture. The land of Shinar is still a town today in Sudan as we've gone over near southern Sudan right here. And this shows you the Sinar kingdom that was founded in around 1750 right here. And here's a map of it. You see the blue now and the white now. This is also the area containing scriptural Babylon and scriptural Shinar. And then we showed you a map from Herman Mall from 1730 that shows what Shinar or Sinar right here that also shows what Susa, the land of Susa. And we know Susa is a scriptural region too that's also depicted in this land. So the story of Hadassah, the story of Esther as it's commonly known, more than likely took place somewhere in so-called Sudan in this region. We're going to briefly touch up on this, but we even showed you a, what, 1592 map that showed, what, Babel Malek, which means King of Babel, and we showed you Babel Mandel, and this is where the Tower of Babel took place around this region right here that separates, what, Arabia from Africa along this area of present-day Djibouti and also Eritrea right just north of Ethiopia, very close to Babel or what, Babel, Babylon in the same region of southern Sudan and northern Ethiopia. Along with media, that's not too far as we see in this map and as I've just shown you in the 1525 map, media is not that far. Why is it important to recap all of that? Well, because remember how we went over in Brashith, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, the word Akkad? Because interestingly enough, we also see here, according to Strong's themselves, that Akkad is the name of a city in what they call Northern Babylon. And we see right here that it's only shown in one place in scripture in Brashith chapter 10, verse 10. Now remember we told you to keep this word in mind right here, Akkad for Agade right there, as it's commonly known too. Now we're going to see that on ancient maps, and I'm going to take you to an ancient map from 1635 that's going to show you this, and where is this located? Now this is a very important map of Africa that was sketched in 1635 by William Blau. Now the reason this map is so important is because it shows you a ton of scriptural regions. Now if you look very carefully, this is known as Western Africa right here. You see down here the region of Median, there's Media right there. So we know that within the African region also contains a cod that it's nearby. And so when you take a look at this map, you see what? A gauge right here. There it is right there. You see it once, twice, and then you see it a third time up here and a fourth time over here. So you see it's in this region where? Near present-day Chad, near present-day Niger. That is where this is found right here. You see it once again over here. And it looks to be that it's along what? That it's very close by to the Niger River that's located right here. And the Niger River extends all the way from over here, all the way from Media over here. And it goes all the way this way. And we see that what we see a gate right here. And we see it over here in these regions and areas and places too.
The Niger River is very important because according to ancient maps, as we've shown you, now this is the kingdom of Medra or what media nearby. And you see median right here. But it even says here in ancient maps that Niger River was known as the Nile of the so-called Negroes. What is that telling you? It says some geographers believing the Niger to be a branch of the Nile, having therefore called it the Nile of the Negroes. Why is it very important for this river? the Niger River to be connected or a branch of the Nile? Because it very well could be one of the four rivers that scripture speaks of when it comes to the four rivers of Eden. It could be. Again, this is something that will require more further research, but it very well could be, and it has significance and importance. Especially since this map from 1742, this 1742 map shows Euphrates River right there. You see the Euphrates River in Ghana right above Judah back then as it was known. Because remember, as we talked about in the video, our people, they fled up northward as it's commonly known into so-called Western Africa. But where is this river located? Near the Niger River. So that's very important. And it just so happens that the Euphrates River, as it's listed, is located near the Niger River that also is connected to the Nile, that is not a surprise or a coincidence. Now here is a close-up of that same 1635 map that we just looked at earlier ago, and it shows you a gauge right here. So you see it right here, you see it right here, a little bit up close, you see it over here, and once again you see it right here. So you actually see it in five places, one, two, three, four, five, all within the same region, all within the same vicinity of Niger and Chad. Chad and Niger present day are the main two locations that we're going to be looking at. Of course, that's interconnected with what with so-called Sudan, which interconnects with Babylon also with media to the south. So we see that they're all interconnected. We see that they're all together. We see that they're all located within the same central region of South Central Africa. Now, another thing to keep in mind, too, and that's important about this map from 1635 is the fact that it says Libya interior, because like we've gone over, scriptural Libya is not in present day Libya, because once upon a time, Libya was known as so-called Western Africa. So we see a gate right here that is referenced a cod, and we saw that in ancient maps around South Central Africa, around the regions of present day Chad and Niger. Well, it just so happens actually that the same name, a gate right there that you saw, is what formerly spelled with an S, as we just saw, and as we just looked at the ancient maps and saw, which is what a gate, a gates right there, is the largest city where in central Niger. Huh, very interesting and suspicious indeed, because when we looked at the ancient map, it was in the exact same region in the region of Niger, and it's even called a, a Gades region right here. This is a very important region and your government knows this. And what am I talking about? Oh, you'll see in a moment because America is fascinated with this region. But anyway, it says here that a Gades region and forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation, but it's an administrative region in where? Niger? So we see that it's the largest subdivision of an African state. And then we just went to, and I just showed you its capital department. Now, interestingly enough, this region represents well over half the total area of Niger, which is the largest of its seven regions. Despite its size, this region is sparsely populated. Now, if you go to Google Maps, you can actually see it to take a better look at it. Here's Niger right here, which is, again, the same region that we saw on the ancient map. Now, here is the actual town right here. But it's interesting, what I thought was interesting, if you look at this city and if you type it with an M right here, you get a little bit more of a region towards the east of the same city that we just looked at. And it's near Chad, too, in the Canaan region. And we're going to be talking about that in a moment to come, the ancient Canaan region region because this region right here is very important. This region of Chad, Niger, and even Nigeria, and a little bit of Cameroon over here is very significant scripturally speaking, and your government knows this. 
Did that explain why there's so much war in this region? Because where did the US, where did your government build the drone base in Niger? Did they build it in the same scriptural region as a God's right here or a Gade's Niger? Is that where they built it? The same region of scriptural Akkad or scriptural Assyria? Why in the world are they so interested being there? Why would they need to build a drone there? Very interesting and suspicious indeed. Why would they need to put a military base there? What business do they have there in other nations too, but especially here? Because now we're going to look at a list of U.S. drone bases containing military bases where the U.S. operates unmanned aerial vehicles. Why? Because are they trying to keep people out of these regions because they know the truth about them? Well, let's see. Because if you go to Niger, where are their two bases at right here? You see that they're located where? In that same region, in the region we just looked that in a gates right here which is the same spelling as a cod and where in niger itself and if you actually look at more of the city itself, according to Wikipedia, it says that the U.S. is building the base, a dedicated drone air base from which to more easily monitor so-called terrorist activities in West and North Africa. In addition to extremists coming from the Sahel, it was revealed in 2016 that the military base in Niger cost the U.S. military $100 million. Or are they going there and building it in order to keep out people from knowing the truth, blocking people from knowing the truth, and of course giving us their lies of, oh, extremism and oh, terrorism and oh, that's the reason they're going. Could that explain why Islam, why they're so interested and intrigued with this region too? Could that explain all of the unrest that's going on in Niger and Nigeria also? Could that explain why Boko Haram is in that region too? Because they're a jihadist militant organization based in northeastern Nigeria, also active where? In Chad, Niger, and northern Cameroon? Isn't that the same region of Akkad that we just looked at? Isn't that the same region of ancient Assyria and you see that not only is your government's interested in this region but so is Islamic militants too the Arabs too but of course they're going to keep lying about it of course they're going to keep trying to play the game cover up even though they've been exposed of course they're going to keep lying about it because they've been lying about it for how many hundreds if not thousands of years so why not keep the lie going they're going to keep doing it not anymore they're not and they can keep making up videos and keep making up things to keep people bound to the lies but no the truth is what will make you free now there's a reason we're here and there's a reason I'm showing you this link right here which is what the Kebi state that's located in northwestern Nigeria there's a reason for this it says Kebi is a state in northwestern Nigeria with its capital at Birnin Kebi the state was created out of a part of Sokoto state in 1991 Kebi state is bordered by Sokoto state Niger state right there Zamfara state the Doso region in the Republic of Niger and the nation of Benin or, or benign right there and so you can see now the reason that we're located here is because I'm about to show you some academia sources when it comes to this region and when it comes to this area that also support what this area being what the area of ancient Assyria as we've just even gone over with maps but it says Kebi is traditionally considered by Sarki mythology as the homeland of the Banza Bakwe states and Hausa kingdoms according to recent research based on local oral traditions king lists and on the Kebi chronicle and I'm going to show you that in just a moment now listen to this the state of Kebi was founded towards 600 before the Messiah by refugees of who the Assyrian Empire conquered by who Babylonian and Median forces didn't we just show you that Babylon is where in so-called Sudan and media is not that far in this same region located in Nigeria and Chad also and then Assyria located in Niger extending all the way towards Chad and Sudan huh very interesting and suspicious indeed that is not a coincidence whatsoever and again with all of the unrest and all of the wars going on in this region just as we've talked about and just as we've covered when it comes to World War one and all of the wars that took place in so-called South Africa and the apartheid do you really think they were just going to war for no reason do you really think that it was all just oh just going to war for terror 
terrorism. No, they were doing this because they're hiding true scriptural locations and evidence, not anymore. But now we're going to be taking a look at some more academic resources on Assyria itself. Now that we've covered and looked at some scriptural sources and historical sources, now it's time to look at anthropology, archaeological, and academic all together. And so here we are at this document that was published by Dierk Langa, who is a professor, and we're going to be going over the anthropology and the archaeological significance of this region. Now, this was a report called and entitled and published in Anthropos, it says, an Assyrian successor state in West Africa, pages 359 through 382. This is very important because it says, the ancestral kings of Kebi as ancient Near Eastern rulers. Now we're going to read the abstract, then we're going to go over a few things where it says, on the basis of newly discovered documents in the Hausa state of Kebi, Nigeria, the present article argues that the foundation of the state was the result of a conquest by Assyrian immigrants towards 600 before the Messiah. Now that's interesting because what Assyrian immigrants, where is Assyria today? All the major sources of the history of the state support this theory. A chronicle derives the origin of the Kabawa from Madayana, a name probably referring to Assur in Nayanua or Nineveh, the Kanta tradition postulates an immigration of the state-building ancestors from Arabia. The long king list has 33 names of kings. Now, they're going to tell us that they're from that fake land region. Again, we have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. But then it goes on to say that it has 33 names of kings, which can be shown to have ruled in the ancient Near East. And the short king list concentrates on Kebi and omits nearly all the non-African kings. From the names included in the long king list, it appears that the early kings kings of the Kabawa were what? Ancient Near Eastern rulers and that the author of the list believed in a continuity between Assyria and Kebi. So what we're going for and what we're sharing with you is that the Kebi and Assyria, that what? Are they synonymous? Are they coinciding hand in hand? In chronological order, the names refer to the Akkadian Amorite and to the Neo-Assyrian period. The departure of the Assyrian refugees from Syria Palestine, that's what they're telling us, is referred to by name of the Babylonian conqueror of Assyria and the name of the last Assyrian king. Nigeria, Assyrians in Africa, migration, state foundation, conquest state, African king list, ancient Near Eastern king list, traces of ancient Near Eastern kings in Africa. But based on ancient maps and ancient texts that we just looked at, let me ask you this. Could the real truth be that they never really migrated at all, that really that the Assyria is really in Africa? Now, I'm not going to go over all of this, but I will link it in the description box below. But again, what we have to do is use discernment because we know there's been a ton of cover up. However, on page 361, notice what it says. It says, field research on the history of Kebi has revealed the existence of a rather uniform legend of origin told all over Kebi and also in the neighboring region of Adair in northern Hazaland, which attributes the foundation of the state to a figure called called Kanta. Comparisons with other legends of origin have shown surprising similarities with what? With the Assyrian state legend centered on the historical figure Sargon of Akkad. So what this is trying to tell you is that there are similarities between Sargon of Akkad in the Assyrian state along with the figure called Kanta in the Kebi region. They are very similar. Could it be because they're the exact same thing? So again, this is a 24-page document. Now we're here on page 363, which gives a map and shows a map. Now what this author hypothesizes is that they hypothesize that there was a great migration, as you can see, in the fake region all the way to Africa. That in the fake region of fake Assyria, that they migrated southward into so-called Niger and so-called Nigeria, and they migrated there. But what we are trying to show you is what if they were already in this region or what if they actually migrated within this region over here which is the real region of so-called Mesopotamia scriptural Mesopotamia what if it all took place over here
we're here on page 365 and we're here for a couple of reasons now if you take a look at the document it says right here however as we will see the legendary kanta was a historical nobody again are they just telling us that for what to play the game of cover-up but as it keeps going it says as for the house title sarkai or sarki it should be noted that it is derived from the akkadian title sarkisati which was indeed first used by sargon of a Cod. Do you think that's a surprise or a coincidence? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I wanted to bring your attention to was this paragraph right here that says, in conclusion, it appears from the early part of the Kebi Chronicle that the traditionalists of Kebi were convinced that their ancestral kings had ruled over a powerful kingdom before the great migration to where? The Central Sudan. Why is that so important that they would migrate to Central Sudan? Because what is Central Sudan known as today? The land of Shinar, Babylon, the land of Babylon. That is what that region is known for. So could it be that they migrated from so-called Niger and Chad, which is scriptural Assyria, to this region, to Babylon? Well, let's find out. Now it keeps going to say that the capital city from where their ancestors came was Madayana, a city called in Aramaic, the towns. Now it's very interesting, I found this interesting at least, that what? Madayana sounds just like what? Madaya or media. But let's keep going. It says it more likely corresponded to the central towns of Assyria than to Mad Mada in Kisra of the Parthian and Sasanian periods. For this and other reasons, the ancestral kings of Kebi had certainly been ruling in Mesopotamia, but we know where that is now. On their way to central Sudan, if you keep reading on page 366 where we are. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this, but then the next section goes into something that is very important, and that's the Kanta legend and the Sargon legend, so-called, two national sagas compared. It says the Kanta legend is widely known among the Hausa-speaking Kabawa, the Fulani cattle herders living in and near Kebi, and the Hausa-speaking people of Adair, which is northeast of Kebi. Now then it goes on to say, in Kebi, where the kings consider themselves as descendants in our incarnations of Kanta, it is closely linked to kingship. And it goes into some of the details in the legend itself. Like I said, if you would like to read it, you can do so on your own time. However, if you keep going, it then says this. It says, as a state saga providing legitimacy to a usurper, the Kanta legend of Kebi may be compared to the Sargon texts of Mesopotamia, which relate the the rise to power of Sargon, the founder of who, of what? The Akkadian Empire. So you see right here, this is literally telling you right here with sources to back it up to that what the Kanta legend of Kebi, which is the region in northwestern Nigeria, near Niger, where ancient maps depict ancient Akkadia, they're showing you that this legend is comparable to the Sargon text of Akkadia, the founder of Akkadia, the founder of Akkadia where? The Akkadia Empire in Niger. Now, if you keep reading the legend on page 367, what I found very interesting and suspicious indeed about it was how it talks about how the legend, it says he was exposed by his mom in a basket on the river Euphrates. Now, isn't that interesting? Because we just looked at an ancient map from 1742 that showed you the Euphrates River where? Near Ghana. That could also be attributed to the Niger River too in that region, in the West African region near Niger and Nigeria? Huh, very interesting and suspicious indeed. Now, another thing that's interesting to note about this, so we can get some scriptural references too, is right here where it says Kanta as Sargon in the Kebi King list. Any attempt at identification of the state founder of Kebi has to take into account the successive names mentioned in the King list and hence also in the Chronicle of Kebi. And we're going to be taking a look at that King's list so you can see the similarities of scriptural characters too. Now, it says here, before considering the details of the King list, it should be noted that the name Kanta 
corresponds to that of Sargon, which is the Hebrew form of the Akkadian name Sarukinu. And this is according to what? Yashayahu Isaiah 20 verse 1. So we see that Kanta and Sargon are synonymous. We see that they coincide together. And if we actually look at the scripture, we see that what? On account of the usurpation of power by its two bearers, the name is often read Sarukenu, which means legitimate king according to different sources. Now we actually see the word Sargon in scripture pronounced Sargun in Yashayahu Isaiah 20 verse 1. This is the only occurrence that we see it in Strong's 5623 which says Sargon was what? A king of Assyria. So we see right there that what? They're synonymous. Kanta and Sargon. We have our scriptural reference right here as a witness and then we also have the Kebi Chronicles in the Kings list right here along with academia sources as another witness to prove this to prove Kanta as Sargon and to prove with along with maps and geography with this region coinciding with what as attributed to the true region of Assyria scriptural Assyria but what other similarities can we find? Because if we keep reading, we also start to see some linguistic similarities too, because it says here, the name Kanta therefore seems to correspond to an abbreviated popular form of the name Sargon, which by the elimination of Sar, king in Africa, when the proper meaning of the term had been forgotten, would have been reduced to Kenati or Kanta. This etymology is partly supported by the Kanta legend which in the Islamic context has precisely preserved that element of the hero's obedience towards the solemn prediction, in this case the premonition concerning the birth of a calf by a certain cow and the necessary execution of the divine requirement. Now we're not going to go over all of this, but what I found interesting on this page is where it talks about how the name Kanta can be discerned in the Kebi list in the form Muhammadu na Makata, or what? Muhammad of Makata. Which, of course, gives us direct evidence of Arab influence and Islamic influence in this region, which we know took place in this region. But then it keeps going to say, similarly, the Kanta praise song has borne Bagasa na Arkar, which means perhaps man of Baghdad of Arkar or Arku. Of course, that's what they're telling us when it comes to Baghdad. But it says Arku in Akkadian second, designating where in Kanem Bornu. And we're going to be talking about that that region, Kanem Bornu, which is the region of present-day Chad in Niger in just a moment to come. Then it goes on to say, Makata most likely does not refer to a normal male name, but rather by the adjunction of a locative prefix ma to the name of the what? Capital city Akkad. Well, we just identified the capital city of Akkad, which is what? Agade Niger, which we just saw even on ancient maps. Then it says, indeed, the most common epithet of Sargon I subsequent to the foundation of a new capital city was Lugal, which is what? King of Akkad, or that same spelling to denote in Niger. It would be quite plausible if the Hausa form Na Makata was derived from Akkadian Sama Agaid, the one of Makata or Akkad. In that case, parallel to what sanctuary or the made apart place, which has the same prefix, the locative ma, would single out Akkad as a specific, perhaps made apart city. Could that be why your government's over there right now? Huh, very interesting. But as we get towards the page 369, it then says, in view of the traditional separation of what they call Mesopotamia, but we know that region to be where? Along the Nile and in South Central Africa into Babylonia in the South, which we know is Central Sudan or present day Sudan and Assyria, one might expect that what they call Tammuz, and we've gone over that, stands for Babylonia and Kanta Sargon of Akkad for Assyria. Syria.
And again, we know that everything is twisted. They like to tell us the traditional view of, oh, it's divided by north and south, but what if it's been divided by west and east, meaning Assyria took west and present-day Niger, Nigeria, and Chad, and Babylon took east and present-day Sudan and Ethiopia. Huh, very interesting and suspicious indeed. But now we're going to go over the Kebi King list and its four early sections concerning ancient Near Eastern rulers. Now it says historians consider the king list of Kebi a spurious document which does not deserve to be taken seriously. Of course, because these are the same historians that are lying about everything, not anymore. Then it says, although several published versions of the list were at their disposal, they did not use it for their reconstruction of the Kebi history. Instead, they preferred to rely on the near contemporary accounts of the two chronicles of Timbuktu, referring to the rebellion of Kanta against Songhai towards the beginning of the 16th century. But we're going to keep going right here where it says, on the basis of historical considerations, four different sections of the king list may be distinguished, which directly or indirectly confirm the relationship with the Assyrian Empire, supported by Chronicle's account of a migration from Madayana to Kebi and the transfer of the Sargon legend to West Africa. Now it says here, which is very important too, the first section of the Kebi King list, which we're going to take a look at, extends over the first 14 names and we're going to take a look at that from comparisons with king list of the ancient near east it appears that these names now pay attention to this it appears that these names right here without regard for three unidentified names refer to kings from four different nations from where from Kassites to Urartians two Aramean, one Assyrian, one Babylonian, and then it goes on to list the actual king names here. But what I found interesting is that according to the Kebi king list, that what, they refer to kings from what, an Aramean nation, Assyrian nation, and a Babylonian nation, all within the same region, going from and extending from Sudan all the way to Nigeria, wow. Now again, folks, there is nothing that is a surprise or a coincidence whatsoever. If it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. Why am I saying this? Because pay attention to the linguistic similarities of some of these names. Now we're on page 370 and we're at table one. Ancient Near Eastern royal names in the king list of Kebi. Here are the kings in the Kebi list that's right here. As you can see, ancient Near Eastern kings right here identity and chronology of the kings listed right here and they even show you that the highlighted versions are very similar to the ancient near eastern kings why do they have similar names could it be because they were actually the exact same kings huh because this one right here it shows you what barun barun the first and then this one shows you Burnaburius the first who was a 10th Kassite king so we see a similarity right there and then Tabari with Tabrimon right here a second ruler of Damascus and no this is not talking about Syria and we're still doing more research on true ancient Damascus and where that really is but we know that we're getting closer and closer and then we have a few listed kings right here. We have a Kassite king listed, a king of Kish. Now, interestingly enough, we have a king of Elam listed too. Now, scripturally speaking, Elam is within the same region too with Kututuru listed in the Kebi king list and then the ancient Near Eastern kings Kutur. So we see that there is a very similarity right there with the king of Elam that's listed in this ancient document and then the legendary king of Assyria. If you keep going, you find the kings of the early Mesopotamian empires and we know what that word is. One of them in the Kebi list is Tama, which is similar to who? The deity that we've gone over, the king of Sumer in this region too. Now this is where Kanta is listed right here, number 17, Kanta of Sargon right here, founder of the Akkadian Empire. So that entire empire, that entire region of so-called Niger and Nigeria. Now what's very interesting, pay careful attention, number 19, you get Hamarkuma or Hamar. Does that, is that a match for Hammurabi, the sixth king of who? Babylonia. We know where that is. So could it be that King Hammurabi actually ruled over where? In so-called Babylon? 
Now, another interesting thing about this list is they also list Solomon or King Solomon within the list too, but we know where true Yasharal is in so-called Southern Africa along Namibia and those regions. But if we keep going, we see kings of the period of Northern Mesopotamia, and again, we see certain similarities, kings of Assyria right there. We see Pool, another king of Assyria right here during the Neo-Assyrian period right there. And if we keep going, we see table two being listed. Now, what's interesting about the breakdown for table two is that it says Assyrian kings remembered in Assyria, Yasharal, Greece, Kebi, and Bornu. So now it gives you the Kebi list right here, the Bornu list, Greek authors, scriptural context, and then the Assyrian king list too. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this. However, I did want to share this with you so you can actually see it for yourself and see again some of the similarities. Note the similarities between some of the language, the linguistic of the Kanta kings versus the ones of ancient Assyria. You start to see that there are a ton of similarities, and we're going to show you even more similarities and even more sources to come. This just gives you a text of some of who the kings were and some of their similarities. We're not going to go over that today. However, we're going to jump down to page 373. Now, remember, we've gone over Muhammadu na Makata or Kanta Sargon. It apparently concerns the foundation of the Akkadian Empire and as such refers to the same period as what? The Kanta Sargon legend. Now here Hammurabi is listed where it says from 19, the next king on the Kebi list is Hamar Kuma. In view of the parallel names Hamar and Amar, and it goes on to say, it is quite likely that the name refers to who? Hammurabi, the sixth king of Babylon. If these identifications are correct, the second section of the Kebi king list recalls the period of the rise of the Semitic Akkadian and Amorite empires and the extension of their power over the Sumerian city-states. Why is the Amorites important? Because we know the Amorites were one of the what? Enemy nations of Yasharal and could have been giants. And we know that there were giants all along the region of Central Africa as we've gone over in the documentary. So again, this is not a surprise or a coincidence how history and how these documents and sources and geographical maps are all pointing to the same region. You see how on this page 374 that what the second great Hittite king and conqueror of Babylon is also mentioned. Hittites, Babylon in Sudan. Then it keeps going on and even to makes a mention of Musha, Moses, the legendary ancestors of who the Yaudium or the Yasharalium, the Israelites as it's commonly known today. According to the Kebi Chronicles, the strange first name Bata for Moses could result from an abbreviated form of the Hebrew Tabat basket, which might be an allusion to the story of Musha Moses being exposed in a basket on what? The River Nile? Huh, where's all of this really taking place? Now, I also find this interesting on page 375, where it says the traditionalist of the neighboring state of Zamfara borrowed nearly all the names with the exception of the fourth section and the last two names in section three and integrated them into their king list and their chronicles, according to the historic records. Now, it also says in view of the common rule of the ancestors in the east, Zamfara traditionalists apparently thought that they were entitled to use the ancient names from the Kebi material when writing up their own history. Now, if you see, Zamfara itself is a region that's located right here in Nigeria. So it's right near the Kanta region or the Kebi region that's over here. It's right next to it. Here's Zamfara right on the border of Niger too. And there again, once is ancient Akkad up here right there. So we see it even extended all the way into Nigeria. Now, another very important detail that I wanted to focus on is what? The migration patterns, but not only that, the invasion of Central Sudan. Because this document's going to tell you waves of refugees and consequence after the fall of Assyria. Could it be the fall of Assyria in present day so called Niger, Nigeria, and even extending towards Chad? Instead of a wave of immigration coming from the Nile Valley in the early Exian period, as suggested by a few scholars, 
scholars, evidence derived from historical sources in Kebi indicates an invasion of the central Sudan by refugees from the crumbling Assyrian Empire already at the end of the 7th century before the Messiah. This conclusion is supported by the Sargon Kanta legend, the tradition of migration expressed by the Kebi Chronicle, the royal enthronement ceremony, and the analysis of the onomasticon of the Kebi king list. For the neighboring house estates in Canon Bornu, similar conquests are suggested by the message of this legend here, the analysis of the Canon Chronicle, and the examination of the Diwan of Canon Bornu. And we're going to talk about that region in a moment to come. So that lets you know that after the Assyrian Empire and after the fall of Assyria, where did they go? They migrated to Central Sudan. Why would they migrate to Central Sudan? Because right after Assyria, what empire rose? up the Babylonian Empire which according to ancient maps are in central Sudan oh but that's not all because then it goes on to say a comparative study of the Chadic language material also buttresses the idea that the ethnic linguistic and cultural map of the central Sudan was changed by the invasion of who Semitic and other speakers of Hamidal Semitic languages after the downfall of the Assyrian Empire why would that be because after the Assyrian Empire what was the next captivity after Assyria for the scriptural people, for the scriptural Yaudium or the Hebrews, it was Persia, but then what? It was Babylon. So, of course, they're going to be their invasion of Semitic and other speakers. Could it be that some of them migrated to these areas, but then because of Babylonian captivity, they were there in central Sudan with Semitic speaking with evidence to support that? Page 376 goes on to tell us that the fall of the Assyrian Empire was brought about by an alliance of the Chaldeans of Babylonia, and we know Babylonia where? Central Sudan and the Medes. Now, of course, they're going to tell you the Zagros Mountains. However, according to ancient maps, Media is where? Is also in Central Africa too. And it says in 614, Assur was captured by the Medes, and Nayanua fell in 612 after a joint siege of of three months. Now, for the sake of time, if you go on to pages 377 to 379 onward, you'll see the conclusion, but we're here at 379, which says, it is important to realize that the evidence from the central Sudan or present-day Babylon, present-day Shinar, that region suggests a direct link between three different events. The fall of the Assyrian Empire, a great exodus, they say, to the south, but really could it be to the east, and the rise of several sub-Saharan states. As we have seen, according to the Kebi Chronicle, the best candidate for any leadership of a migration towards sub-Saharan Africa was, in fact, Kanta. And then the text goes on to link what? The Kebi to be a successor state of Assyria within Africa. And it even tells you right here, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the state of Kebi was in the full sense of the term an Assyrian successor state. Now, when you take a look at the map of the Kebi state, isn't it very interesting and suspicious how the Kebi state is located along the Niger River? And we've already talked about the significance of that river that's also near this region over here, near Niger, near the same region of Akkad. So could it potentially and possibly be that when we look at a map, when we look at the plain, that we see that this region over here, could it really have been present-day Assyria with with Babylon not too far in this region over here and this entire region comprising what is commonly known as so-called Mesopotamia. But now we're going to take a look at two more sources. We're going to take a look at this one by the same author, and it says, Ancient Kingdoms of West Africa, Africa-centered and Canaanite Israelite perspectives. Now we're right here. This is page 321. If you take a look at it from the Google tabs, page 349 in the actual book that says links between West Africa and the Ancient Orient. Now the Ancient Orient is known as the so-called Ancient Near East or regions such as Babylon, Assyria, which is what this video is covering. 
Now, of course, they're going to tell you to caution between making any links between West Africa and ancient Assyria and these ancient regions and correlating them together. Why? Because they don't want you knowing the truth. But anyway, we're going to keep going. And the reason we're going to go here is because I want to show you something on this page in particular on page 350. Now, if you go to Dirk Langa's website, you'll see that Langa has actually traveled to these regions. So all of the historians that we're quoting and all of the professors and stuff, even in the other video and the documentary itself, these are actual people who have actually been to these lands, actually been to these regions and have firsthand accounts and firsthand witnesses of what they're seeing and what they are documenting and what you need witnesses to establish every matter. So keeping that in mind look at what this page says as an example of such influences in muslim societies i will first consider the kanta saga of kebi and then compare this with the mesopotamian sargon legend and we've already gone over that earlier with respect to pagan societies i will examine notice this part the possibility of a relationship between the shango priest kings of west africa and the priest kings of Assyria. And I will attempt to show that Shango and other Yoruba deities derive from the pantheon of the Syrian and Mesopotamian people. Could it be because the kings of West Africa, because it's the same thing, it's the same relationship, it is the exact same thing. Where is this region located today? Well, we see Yorubalan right here in West Africa and present day Benin, Nigeria, and Togo also. Now we're going to take a look at one more source from Langa, and then that's going to be the video on Assyria so far. And y'all are willing, if we see more and find more on this region, we'll definitely make more subsequent videos. However, this tells you right here from Wikipedia about the Kanem-Bornu Empire. That was an empire that existed in modern Chad and Nigeria. And if you actually take a look at the map, you'll see that it existed in Chad over here, Nigeria over there, a little bit in Cameroon, and a little bit in Niger over there now if you keep going right here and we're going to go right here this is the part that's very interesting and suspicious indeed founding by immigrants it says the origins of canem are unclear of course they're going to tell you it's unclear but then they say some older histories connect the creation of canem bornu with exodus from the collapsed assyrian empire but we just showed you on ancient maps that the assyrian empire would have been in this region near lake chad more recent theories tend to support the idea of a closer origin for, for the migration and we're going to find this source on what the founding of Canem and we're going to go to that source right now. Here is the source right here. We're going to take a look at it. It's 46 pages long, and we're going to be taking a look briefly at pages 31 through 33 that says Working Papers in African Studies number 265. The founding of Canem by Assyrian refugees around 600 before the Messiah. Documentary, linguistic, and archaeological evidence by Dirk Langa, the same professor who we already looked at some of the research and content and materials. We're going to take a look at this too. This was published in Working Papers in African Studies, African Studies Center, Boston University as of 2011. Now it's interesting because in this source we see a similar table that we saw in the other one now around page 29 of the document where it says founding of Canem by Assyrian refugees. Table 2. Assyrian kings remembered by Assyrian, Hebrew, Yaudium, Greek, Arab, Kebi, and Bornu authors, and they list them again with the Syrian king list, the scriptures, Greek authors, and the Arab list, the Kebi list, and the Bornu list. We're not going to go over that because we've already covered uh, something similar to that. But what we will do is go to 1.6, which says Assyrian refugees in the alliance between Duguwa conquerors and local warriors towards the end of page 31, where it says the onomastic analysis of Central Sudanic king lists allows us to infer that Near Eastern people reach Sub-Saharan West Africa claiming descent or at least connections with Babylonian, Elamite, Assyrian, Urartian, Amorite, Aramean and Yasharalium Israelite kings. Do you see that? 
According to linguistic evidence, speakers familiar with the Semitic languages of the ancient Near East seem to have migrated to the region of Lake Chad and introduced important innovations such as the state, the notion of urban settlements, and horse riding. When it says Semitic languages, could it be that the Semitic peoples, aka the Yaudium, the Hebrews, were led captive to Assyria, and that is how that happened in this region, in the region of Niger in Nigeria, not to mention what? Central Sudan, Babylon. Of course, they're going to tell you the migration patterns, but according to scripture, what? Captivity. Is that how all of this is happening? Do you see how all of this is starting to piece together? Now, of course, on page 33, they give the map once again. You can see the same map that we looked at on page 363 in the other document and source. But really, should it be that Babylon is over here, Elam is over here, Assyria is over here along this region, and even could have extended all the way towards present-day Sudan, and that it was really all in this region where all of this took place. So as a recap, and again, as we continue to learn this and as we continue to put the pieces all together, being led by Yahuwah himself, we will continue to show more and reveal more and more truth will be revealed. But we know that Assyria is within this region right here, Babylon over here in present day Sudan, Media nearby that's not too far away, and we know Yasharal is located over here towards the south. Here is a present day picture of Agades Niger right here as you can see or ancient Akkad, ancient Assyria. Now is all of this a coincidence? Is all of this just mere surprise? You decide and as always continue to seek Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha for even more truth. But what we're looking to do Yahuwah willing is actually do more videos on true locations on different topics and different ancient scriptural locations. If you would like for this to continue please let me know in the comment box below but prayerfully this video was helpful unto you this is truth unveiled here saying as always shalom